Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Sarah, and thank you all so much for coming on this. Uh, it's really great that this has been organised at this stage in this parliament, because I think, as Sarah says, uh, by the way, I'm assuming that uh, um, I'm preaching to the converted. We don't need to rehearse uh, the arguments or persuade anyone on this uh, Zoom uh, session uh, of the merits of electoral reform and why uh, we should be in favour of it in the Labour Party and do what we can to persuade the Labour Party to adopt it as party policy. Um, but absolutely, you know, if, if there are differing views and if people want to come back uh, at me in, in the Q&A in a second, then please feel free. But I'm just going to speak as if uh, we all want that to happen, about how we make it happen. Like Sarah, I think that um, uh, we have the best chance, uh, well, for... 20, 30 years uh, of furthering this agenda. Um, contrary to uh, popular belief, um, we actually did quite a lot when we were last in government and we had quite a progressive, radical, constitutional reform agenda leading up to the 97 election. Uh, we had the, uh, uh, the Jenkins Commission, uh, which some of you may remember. Um, which did very important work, I think, led the groundwork for the sort of system that you could envisage uh, a Labour or a, uh, a, a Labour-led government uh, moving towards uh, after the next election. And it was, is, is, it was indeed the system that we then went on to introduce in Scotland, Wales, and to a certain extent, uh, Northern Ireland. And we also legislated, of course, for uh, proportional representation in the European uh, elections, which had up until then uh, been first past the post. So uh, we did a lot, but we didn't finish the job. And I think this should very much be couched in terms of the next Labour government uh, continuing our tradi proud tradition of, of democratic and constitutional reform, modernising the infrastructures of uh, UK democracy and the state, and finishing the job that we started back then. And I think the argument has never been easier to win in the Labour Party and in the Labour movement. I mean, for some of the reasons that Sarah has already mentioned, but also that I'm sure you're very well aware of. And they're particularly strong and cogent in our region because of the way that the first past the post system not only um, disenfranchises huge swathes of, of not just Labour voters, but the voters of, of the losing parties all over the region, and means that they are, we are unrepresented, as, unrepresented mm. as a party, but skews the whole political map of the United Kingdom uh, in a way that has not just repercussions uh, for how we're governed here, but repercussions in terms of the future of the union, puts strain and stress on the union, um, uh, creates uh, unnatural polarizations and divides across England between the regions, um, and generally leads to uh, a less well-functioning uh, politics. Now, how are we going to get this uh, firstly into our manifesto and then legislated for? Well, I think, first of all, we have to work, as is the purpose of this session this evening, uh, to uh, change minds at local level, uh, where minds don't need to be changed, to pass motions, um, to send to the party, but most importantly, to next, uh, to next year's party uh, conference. And I, mean, a lot, I know a lot of people feel that motions often uh, don't matter, but if you pass um, as your conference motion, a motion on electoral reform, and that motion has uh, more support than any other leading up to party conference, it can have a massive effect, as we saw um, with the Brexit motions that helped change our party policy uh, on, on Brexit um, during the last parliament, thanks to the grassroots campaign that came up through local constituency parties, uh, socialist societies and the trade unions. So please do what you can at local level to get this issue discussed in your branch, at your branches, get the issue discussed at your uh, CLP levels, at GCs or your all member meetings, depending on what system you have, get motions passed. Um, there's never been a better time in the Labour Party to get high level speakers, uh, partly because we're all, all meeting virtually, 
Uh, it's much easier now, for example, to get a shadow cabinet or, or shadow minister to speak at a meeting in Cornwall, who, whereas in the past, um, it was extremely difficult to get anyone to travel that length of distance to go to attend a meeting. Now it's, it's no bother for a, for a shadow minister or for another high profile speaker if you want to get one to come and talk to your CLP on this issue. Um, if you're members of trade unions, put this issue on the agenda of your union meetings as well. Traditionally in the party, uh, it's been the unions who have been partly uh, the main center of resistance to electoral uh, reform. Um, um, they have naturally tended to be conservative with a small uh, C and uh, uh, but that is changing, I think, and um, the more unions that come out in favour, they still have a significant voice and vote at party conference, uh, the better. Um, if you have a Labour MP, I think probably most of the Labour MPs in the South West, uh, someone will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, are if not sympathetic, then outwardly supportive of electoral reform, then speak to them uh, as well, encourage them to talk about this as an issue. I mean, I think that um, it may not be, for example, that the most sensible thing for us to do is to get a commitment or a promise uh, to legislate for electoral reform in the manifesto itself. That would be the ideal as far as, I'm, as, as far as I'm concerned. But what's important is that we get a strong and clear commitment in our next man man manifesto that points towards um, electoral reform, either through uh, a constitutional reform agenda or through uh, a constitutional convention or something like that that could be used as a vehicle uh, to then legislate uh, for electoral uh, reform. It may be that electoral reform in local government uh, should be the starting point and there'll be all sorts of different views and different tactical considerations here depending on where we think the balance of opinion is on this. Um, but we should certainly all be working towards trying to do this because um, as, as I think everyone on this, on this call understands, if we'd had a, a fairer voting system, we wouldn't have had some of the disastrous policy decisions that we've had uh, in our recent history, whether Iraq uh, or the Brexit a referendum, uh, we would have had in all likelihood, a progressive government for much more of the last century than we have had when we've had uh, minority run conservative governments uh, dominating our, our system. And in terms of the Labour Party's future health and recovery, particularly in those regions where we are underrepresented, this would be a huge boost uh, for us. And uh, we have a, a, there's a much stronger argument and a more convincing argument to be made in our region, which is why it's so important that our region maximizes the number of CLPs who come out in favor of this and who send motions to party conference. Use the policy forum process as well, uh, the regional conference process, any um, avenue and tool that you have uh, to put this on the agenda, because when we've got over COVID uh, and when Brexit um, uh, has happened, Yes, there will continue to be debates about our future relationship with the European Union and they will be incredibly important. But in terms of the real policy wins for us internally in the party, which will be good in the short term and medium and long term for our country, this is something that we could achieve in the relatively short term. And uh, then hopefully if we get a Labour majority or Labour led government after the next election, can legislate for, uh, and which will have lasting a lasting positive impact, impact long after uh, we've all uh, left the uh, political stage. So I don't really want to say any more than that. Um, let's have a discussion about this. Um, let's work out how we can make this happen, how we can work together, how we can help each other to make this uh, happen. And hopefully, um, come back in a year's time, a couple of years time, with a real feeling that there's momentum behind this um, and uh, that it's going to happen uh, in the next, under the next Labour government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, 
uh, while you were talking, lots of good questions coming in. So um, I think what I'll do is I'm going to try to curate them into similar types of questions. And if possible, Alex, can we see everybody? Um, just so that, because I, I would like to ask people to ask their own question if they'd like to, otherwise I can read them out, but it's nice, I think, if people want to ask their own. I've taken the spotlight off. Um, if you change your- gallery view, don't we? Yeah. There we are. Everybody, I can see everybody, hello. Um, so I've got three questions which are similar-ish, um, basically about how we make it work, what it looks like, how we get there. Um, so Stuart Roden, John Lintel, and John Merritt, in that order, if you want to unmute, ask your question, and then Ben, when all three have asked, you'll get a sense of the response. Thank you. So Stuart, over to you. If you're here. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? We can. All right, thank you. Yeah, it was about what, how Ben saw the roadmap of getting there, particularly, obviously, uh, we can change party policy, uh, but we need to get ourselves elected um, in a position where we can change legislation. So, um, I mean, obviously it, it um, goes towards the uh, what is probably a sensitive issue of potential uh, joint manifestos or electoral packs or uh, electoral arrangements, whether you, you think that that is something we need to do or whether there's an alternative way. There was at the last meeting I attended, people were very much against that. And I just wonder how we break through that log jam. Thank you. Um, John Lintel. Is he there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi there. Um, yeah, same, same page as Stuart's, really. Um, ben, I suspect that a thoroughgoing policy on electoral reform would considerably enhance the prospects of, a, uh, of the party at a general election and might conceivably even deliver us to power. My question concerns what then? How can we break out of a broken first past the post system? into some form of PR and bring other parties with us? Or will it come to be seen as just another failed political ruse to be confined yet again to the waiting room of history? Thank you very much. And actually, I think John Merritt's question is slightly more which system to use base. So I'm going to actually save that for the next round and then Ben leave you with those two questions to answer if that's okay. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I might partially answer um, the second uh, John's question in terms of my response, because it's about how we get there in the roadmap. I mean, my personal, my personal uh, preference uh, would be not to get bogged down in advance on systems um, and types of electoral reform, um, because you end up going down rabbit holes with um, STVers versus Jenkinsers versus um, advocates of other systems, uh, and I, I think I think that would be that be a real mistake. And, and in some ways, I think um, it would be more effective, and we'd be more likely to win this. This is just my personal view. Um, if we made it quite clear that a fair voting system was part of our overall constitutional reform agenda put it in with House of Lords reform, put it in with proper regional government, voices for the, for the English regions, um, everything else that, that so needs updating in our um, outdated written constitution as well. Um, why, we did this very successfully in 1997, and what it did before 1997 was it galvanised all progressive opinion around Labour, and I think it did help inflate our vote in response to John's question about um, you know, would this help us, particularly in the southwest? I mean, one of the reasons that 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 we built the majority we have in Exeter is that basically nearly all the Lib Dems and Greens vote vote for me, and one of the reasons they vote for me is because I, I've been such a strong advocate of electoral reform. So, for all of our you know parliamentary candidates in the southwest, for our local council candidates, having this as something you support is is can only help win you votes, particularly when you have a chance of beating the Tory. In your in your seat, so it's a win-win. Uh, it's a win-win for us. Um, John also asked, I mean, how we persuade other parties. I mean, I don't. Most of the other parties don't need persuading. It's only really the Tories that need persuading. And if, as long as they don't win the next election, that doesn't matter. But it's very interesting what's happened in Scotland because the Scottish Conservative Party do not want to go back to first past the post. 
and you can well understand why. And there's, there's nowhere in the world that has gone from first past the post to electoral reform that has gone back again. I mean, New Zealand had a referendum to go back and it was overwhelmingly defeated. So the evidence is out there that one, you, once you move to this system, uh, parties, even parties that resisted it to start with, actually quite, quite, quite like it. Stuart asked about the thorny issue of joint manifestos and electoral pacts. I think the problem with this, Stuart, is while we're still working with the first past the post system, this is really difficult to do uh, in any meaningful or effective way. Firstly, uh, quite a lot of it is against current Labour Party rules. We wouldn't be allowed to do it without, without changing Labour Party rules. Secondly, there's not a lot of evidence out there that formal pacts or joint manifestos uh, under our system go down well with the electorate. Um, the assumption generally is, you know, that if, uh, if there's an electoral pact and, and somebody stands down uh, in, in favour of somebody else, that can help at the margins. And it, it might have helped us in previous elections in a very small number of seats. But sometimes the, the voters react badly against kind of the, the feeling that the system is being ma manipulated by somebody or by the political parties. Um, I think a, fa a, far more, a far more effective way, and again, we saw this in 97 and to some extent in 2001, where you know, we benefited um, in the Southwest in particular massively from anti-Tory tactical voting. One of the reasons we benefited from it was because we had good policies on, on electoral reform and constitutional reform. So Lib Dems and Greens felt very comfortable voting for us. Um, when they to, to stop the Tory winning or to keep a Labour MP, I think that is just as likely to maximise the number of Labour, Lib Dem, Green MPs at the next election than any formal pact or joint manifestos. If our manifesto says something similar to the Lib Dems or the Green manifesto on electoral reform or constitutional reform, great. But I'm not sure that there'd be very much to be gained by standing candidates down. And what you will often find in even in seats that are completely unwinnable for us, is that you'll find very strong resistance from Labour members and Labour voters to not having a candidate. Um, and what happened, you know, what you just what you do is you have a candidate, but then you, you don't work the seat very hard. You go and work in the seat that we can actually win, um, and we know which seats those are. Uh, there are going to be quite a lot of them in, in the southwest at the next election. So our resources are going to be thinly enough spread in focusing on trying to win those seats, but. I mean, I, th I think generally uh, standing candidates down and that kind of pact is probably not going to be a runner. It's not going to help us make the argument with those forces of conservatism, if you don't mind me calling them, in parts of the party and, and parts, of the trade, uh, parts of the trade union uh, movement. So, yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic that we can achieve this without, without that. And the other thing which, you know, some of us ex have experienced is that, is that, you know, you, you can be as pro... European, uh, you can be as pro electoral reform or as pro Europe as you like. And in the last election, the the, um, the 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 Lib Dems in Exodus stood down in favour of the Green as the progressive uh, pro European candidate against me. I mean, you couldn't get more pro European or progressive than me. The result was that uh, they did the Lib Dems and Greens did really badly. Well, the Lib Dems, of course, didn't do anything at all because all, all, all their votes came to me, didn't go to the Greens. So I think you can, tr you can try to be too clever by half on this. Let's get the system changed. And then when we have a new world of coalitions and cooperation and our culture changes, that might make the kind of difference that, that we're looking for in, 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 that, in, in the way that you suggest. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, I, I actually in South Swindon we had a sort of similar situation where, in it was just a three-way race in the end: Tory, me, and Lib Dem. And I was asked, did I want the Lib Dem to stand down? And I said, actually, no. I think you know morally, I don't think the voters appreciate being told they've only got two choices. Um, but actually, I didn't feel it was going to do us any favours anyway. And um, uh, yes, and the, and the result was what it was. <laughs> it was a, a, the usual two horse race with a few votes to the Lib Dems and that was it. Um, I'm moving on to some more questions. Um, I'm going to ask um, the following three people in this order. Uh, Paul Dunn from uh, North Somerset, Paul Tucker, 
Um, and off the top of my head, I can't see your CLP, but maybe you'll tell us when you ask your question. And uh, Ewan Wad as well. So uh, Paul Dunn first, please. Hello, Ben. Nice to see you. Um, it's good to see you looking so well. Um, I, I wonder, you've touched on this to some extent, but I wonder which problems you think we have to deal with, um, which policies we need to adopt and introduce to actually move towards electoral reform and PR. And uh, then Paul Tucker. Hi there. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Oh, you're in Bath. Lovely. Welcome. Hmm. We've got it. There we are. Yep. Sorry, I'm pretty new to this. So this is probably a question that you've been asked many, many, many times before. But I, I wonder when it seems so obvious that conservative parties always do far more harm than, sorry, conservative governments always do far more harm than Labour governments do good. Why, since 1951, has there never been a strong move towards proportional representation from either Labour governments or Labour oppositions? I realise you said something that had happened before 97, but that's the question. Um, and then uh, Ewan, please. Hi, yeah, um, I've sort of got two questions. One is, what work can you do within the parliamentary party and within parliament in general to push for proportional representation and electoral reform? But then also, are there any common criticisms that you found a good way of countering when we're trying to argue for this within CLPs? Um, let me start with you, and great to see you, you, and good to have some uh, young faces as well on the on the Zoom. Um, the, the, the support for for actual reform in the PLP has never been stronger. Uh, I mean, to be perfectly honest, we haven't uh, we haven't begun to really focus on taking this this campaign forward in the PLP in any meaningful way at this stage because of COVID and everything else that's been going on and Brexit. Uh, but I'm sure that we will. And um, as a proportion of the PLP, uh, I mean, I haven't got the exact figures in front of me, but it's the highest proportion that there's ever been uh, in favour of, of electoral reform. So I don't think the MPs are the issue here. The issue is to get going to get those MP is to get those MPs going out and making the case and being leaders in their constituencies and in their and in their communities. Um, which I think I think we can we can do, um, but it's that will uh, that task will be much, be made much easier, and MPs will feel they've got more of a license to do that if they feel there's a grassroots campaign as well among the members and some pressure from below. Um, in terms of the arguments, I mean, uh, I mean, if, if there are particular arguments that you find difficult to counter, you put them on the chat, and I'll come back to them in a second. But um, one of the reasons for having this session this evening and for hooking you all up together is that um, the Labour campaign for electoral reform and the sort of uh, the Labour movement for a new democracy, which is kind of going to be the umbrella uh, campaign moving for, forward to the next election, will be able to provide you with all the arguments that you need if you need them, if you've got a meeting coming up. Um, uh, and I'm sure that uh, if they, they don't already exist, that there will be briefing materials and Q&As and everything that you might feel might be helpful to you. Uh, it, you know, if you're thinking of making a speech or if you don't know how to answer a particular, uh, a particular question. I think this leads on to the question that, um, that the second Paul asked, which is why, why, it's, why it hasn't happened before. Um, I think the simple answer to that, Paul, is that until quite recently, um, Believe it or not, in arithmet arithmetical terms, first past the post favoured um, favoured the Labour Party in terms of the number number of seats it delivered uh, to us uh, for the equivalent percentage of the, of, of the vote. So uh, it was a it was a it was a it was a simply a matter of short term self interest. I think that a lot of uh, the Labour movement thought, well, we don't want to change a system which works well for us. Uh, it delivers us majority Labour governments, admittedly not as often as any of us would like, um, but it does so 
on a lower share of the, with a bigger majority on a lower share of the vote than it does for the Conservatives, for example. That has now changed. So the, for the last two, if not three elections, uh, the first past the post system based on the current boundaries favours the Tories. So they get a bigger majority now uh, on the equivalent share of the vote than we would. And that surprise, surprise has changed uh, the dynamic um, and the um, direction of the argument within the Labour movement because Labour MPs uh, and councillors and um, trade unions are beginning to think, ah, oh, this system isn't really working for us. Uh, it's, it's working better for the Tories. So that has definitely helped us uh, to make the argument. Along with, I think, has been the experience of, 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 of new voting systems in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, you know, we had a, as the mother of all democracies, there was a sort of cultural uh, a defensiveness about, about our system. Um, and I, I think that has, that has, is withering on the vine, if not already, already withered. And I think the Brexit, the calamity of the Brexit um, uh, referendum on a minority of the vote delivered by a minority Tory government as well, or a Tory government with a minority of the votes has really helped has really helped consolidate uh, our lead in terms of opinion within the within the party. And of course, something I've forgotten to say is that all of the internal polling of, of Labour members shows overwhelming support for electoral reform. And that's an argument that we should continue to use as often as we can. Um, Paul asked a question about what policies, nice to see you Paul, by the way, um, what policies um, we need to adopt to win this argument, but also I think Stuart asked a similar question about well, what policies do we need to win the next election? I mean, I don't think this evening is, is, a, is, a, is the evening to have a debate about how we win the next election, because that's, that's gonna depend on a whole number of things. Um, uh, all I would say is that six months you know, into the new leadership, six, seven months into the new leadership, the polls are looking a lot better than they did, but that doesn't mean to say we don't still have a huge amount of decline. I mean, if you just look at the seats that we need to win in the Southwest to get a majority Labour government, they include seats that we've never won before, like the Bournemouths, for example. So it's going to be a, have to be a whole range of policies, but also um, the regaining of, 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 of the public's trust in Labour as, a, as a, an alternative, competent government that they feel they can vote for. Um, and I'm not sure that it would be helpful to get into detailed policy debates at this stage in the parliament when there's still so much uncertainty because of COVID and what might or might not happen with, with, with Brexit. But I still think that it should be a given for us that a strong, radical offer of constitutional and democratic renewal and reform should be part of any Labour manifesto. Uh, and I think that will have broad appeal. And I think that will help us win the election uh, along with everything else. Um, and winning that election, uh, either as a majority Labour government or as a, a Labour-led government is going to be absolutely key in achieving any of this. Um, um, all of the stuff we want to do as a Labour government, but not least uh, electoral reform and the constitutional form that everyone on this Zoom would like to see. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think you're right that in terms of what voters would like to see, I think it was clear a year ago when you very kindly came and campaigned with me in South Swindon that change was what people wanted, but it wasn't necessarily what they were being presented with or how they perceived they were being presented um, a choice in the current electoral sort of scheme of things. Um, so I, I, I do think that having something central to our manifesto is going to be positive. Um, but, but you're right, it's, it's, it's a way off till the next election and there's plenty to get through uh, before then. Um, a few more questions. I've, I've failed slightly in curating these. These are a little bit different to each other, but we'll, we'll get them in as a group anyway. Um, Rob Ewers had a question, as did Ross Leach. And um, Mary wanted to ask a question as well, unless that was a comment. Are you happy with the ask question? Okay, so we'll start with Rob. Thank you. Uh, my question is quite straightforward, but it's not one that I think I've 
been able to pin down an answer to. It might be because there isn't one. Uh, but to the best of your knowledge, what is the view of the leadership on this issue, uh, Keir Starmer and uh, Angela Rayner? Thank you. And uh, Ross, would you like to ask your question as well? Um, would this? Oh. Yeah, uh, would this be done through a referendum or would we put it as if we get into government, this is what we will do? And um, would a uh, change with the House of Lords also be part of this? And Mary. Thank you. Just unmuting myself. Um, hi, Ben. Thanks for coming. I'm sorry I was late and not there to greet you. Um, it's brilliant to hear what you're saying because you agree with virtually everything I think. Just a few points I want to say because it's useful to pick up. About a third, a third, a third of the Parliamentary Labour Party, so a third in favour, a third against. Um, uh, it didn't help us at the last election because most people came in from safe seats and they didn't uh, join up, so we need to do some work there. Um, and what um, you were saying about Scotland, we are going to see absolutely nobody elected on the constituency section in the Scottish parliamentary elections next year. And we'll get them all if we get as many as we should, you know, it will be proportional. Um, we'll get them on the top up list. So a AMS comes to the rescue in Scotland. Uh, so at least we don't just have one. Um, uh, you asked about um, RMPs in the region. We've got Kerry who isn't confident about the arguments, but is in favour and will vote in favour. Uh, Luke is totally in favour because he's dealing with rural areas and they, they miss out even more than the South West as, a, uh, as an aggregate. And the um, Fangham and, and um, oh, Darren's in favour. Um, Fangham is um, hesitant, but her constituency is totally in favour. So my constituency is Bristol West. They couldn't avoid to be in favour. Um, and the, um, other, the one that Aileen will know about, I asked her to come in. She's been plotting um, how to get branches and build up the discussion in the only safe seat that we've got on a really bad day, which is Bristol South, where Karen is not in favour, but her son is. So sorry to steal your answering the questions. I want to know whether you'll do some more of these for different uh, constituencies, especially in Devon. And I know that what you said is right, that Zooms can work for everybody and you can get high, high um, class people like yourself um, uh, to come and not have to travel. But I think it's really important that we, we uh, fill up the whole of the Southwest with resolutions. Uh, we have more reason to do it than any other region because we're not near London and we're completely out of it and we haven't got um, very strong trade unions so they should see that too. I think we've got trade unions in favour so that's a question. Will you do more of these Ben? Yes Mary I'd love to and let's do them all while we're still meeting virtually and I don't yes. have to spend okay. all my time travelling. <laughs> Uh, and also, I think uh, quite a lot of people in CLPs would be grateful to be talking about something else um, exactly. than what, what a lot of them are spending their time talking about at the moment. So, yes, I'll be very happy to do that. Um, thank you for the intelligence, by the way, on the PLP. I mean, it, it's inevitably the case that when we have such a bad result as we did last December and you're down to your safe seats, um, uh, that the dynamic might go backwards temporarily but I think we can I think we can I think we can still make progress uh, on that um, Karen is probably the one I, I was I was least sure about but I suspect I suspect you know we can get her son to work on her and I, I suspect that's also to do with her unite heritage um, anyway say no more um, uh, uh, Robin Ross um, the honest question, Rob, on the leadership is I don't know. I've never had that conversation uh, uh, with, with Keir or Angela, and I've spoken to them both about quite a lot of stuff, but um, uh, I'm not sure it would be terribly helpful at this stage to know, and I don't really think it matters, um, because in the end, uh, if, if, if the party wants it and... Um, they will they will lead it and the thing i the thing that uh, strikes me very much about Kira, i don't know angela so well is that um 
uh, he is refreshingly willing to listen to an argument and be persuaded. And um, he's always got time for discussion and to listen. So I think, um, you know, if we make a persuasive case at the right time, um, and he uh, can be satisfied that it's in his interests, I cannot imagine that he is not in favour of constitutional and democratic renewal and reform, because this is a man who spent his whole life in, um, you know, fighting on human rights law and, um, and other stuff, uh, always on the progressive side of an argument. So, um, and I, I would imagine his, 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 his CLP, I don't know what his CLP's views on this are, but all these things we need to get intelligence on and, and, and work on. Um, Angela, I don't know. Uh, I mean, she's obviously from, obviously from a from a different tradition, and one would instinctively think that she that she was perhaps less likely to be supportive. Um, I think someone like Angela is going to be m m much more attuned to where the debate in the trade union movement is. Um, so uh, I think Unison is her union, wasn't it? So let's get that debate going in 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 Unison, our biggest union, and uh, see where we get to on that. I think. These are the sorts of things that will help um, get the leadership in a position where they feel comfortable to lead on this is, is really what's more important than what they personally, what they, what they personally believe, I think. Um, and Ross, um, oh yes, the thorny question as to whether there should be a, a referendum and whether it should be bound up with House of Lords reform. Look, I mean, House of Lords reform is massively popular. Uh, whichever side of the political fence you are among the public. Um, it's not a kind of, it's not an issue, it's not a sort of bread and butter doorstep issue, but it's not something that's going to lose us votes if we have something on that in our manifesto. Um, uh, because the House of Lords is currently constituted, um, it, 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 it jars against ordinary, decent people's sense of fairness and transparency and accountable democracy. And there are all sorts of people who have different reasons for, for um, uh, I mean, some of us in recent history have been rather grateful for the House of Lords, but I mean, we, we could still have those checks and balances without it being, hered I mean, you know, still having hereditary members and the rest of it reliant on patronage. So uh, of course that argument has to be part of a, an argument made by a Labour Party. Um, whether it's sort of formally attached to laws reform or, um, as I was suggesting earlier, put into an overarching constitutional convention type um, uh, thing, which would also be the thing that could decide on, on the system. I mean, my personal preference uh, is that we've got a system that, um, you know, I think was a very uh, compelling one uh, that was uh, devised by the Jenkins Commission uh, under the Blair Premiership. Uh, we sadly never implemented it in for Westminster elections, but it works perfectly well in Scotland. And incidentally, the reason that we're doing badly in Scotland is, is, is not because of uh, electoral systems, uh, it's because the Scottish Labour has just failed uh, and failed very badly. And you've got the nationalist dynamic there as well, which makes it very, very difficult uh, for us. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, the referendum issue, I mean, I, we're all fed up with referendums, aren't we? I mean, I would love to think that we could just legislate for this if we had a manifesto commitment. Um, there are others who feel that it would be difficult to legislate for without a, without a referendum. Um, but uh, my preference would be enough referendums um, let's have a clear manifesto commitment that gives us a mandate to legislate and as I said before once we've legislated and done it um, it's very unlikely that anyone would want to go back um, but you know we know what the risks are with with referendums they they often don't turn out the way you would like them to because all sorts of other all sorts of other issues come into play rather than the subject that you're actually supposed to be having a referendum on which is exactly what happened, by the way, in the last referendum on AV, where the um, uh, unpopular uh, popularity of the Lib Dems at the time because of their betrayal on tuition fees really damaged the campaign. Um, 
uh, and uh, so yeah so my preference no referendums please but that's an argument I think it's still to be won And so I have two more questions. And so if anybody has further questions, maybe they want to pop them in the chat now while I'm putting these last two to Ben. I, I do think though maybe John Merritt, your question might just have been answered, uh, but do feel free to ask it um, anyway, if you want to raise it. But also Robin, um, you have a question about boundary reviews. So maybe if um, Robin goes first and then John and, um, We'll see where if anyone else wants to put any uh, last questions in the chat. Okay, uh, thanks Ben for coming to talk to us tonight. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, the questions I got for you, I've actually got a couple if that's okay. Uh, first of all, I have a sense that any changes in politics at the moment seem to be geared towards locking the Conservatives in. And I think boundary reviews is a very much case in point. Uh, and my question was, do you think this is going to make it even less likely that we can get good Labour people elected in forthcoming elections, giving us a bit more urgency to this cause? And my second question is, I, I understand you know a lot about voting and voting habits within the South West, and I wonder, we're all on board with this. As you say, a lot of Labour members are on board with this. What about Joe Public? How do we persuade them this argument is more important than other things, all the other things they're worrying about? Thank you, Robin. That's a really great question. Um, John. Thank you. Um, hello, Ben. Um, yeah, my question you sort of half answered, but, but is a difficult uh, question to answer um, around prioritising uh, the Constitutional Convention or PR as a manifesto commitment. Um, and I would certainly say from the history, of uh, it not having been a, a commitment, like the regional government in 2001 was put to a referendum, that that delay or it stopped it <laughs> going ahead. Um, and so I, th I think that there is a strong argument for uh, it to be part of a, a, a separate commitment to a constitutional convention. And there's still a lot that needs to go into that constitutional convention, not least having a constitution and um, I mean, I would be inclined to include regional government. And I think both of those things appeal to fairness, to, to people's idea of fairness. And although there is a, um, a, a difficulty convincing uh, the public on the doorstep about uh, the, the specific systems and things like that, I think the fairness argument is really strong and the, the regional local argument is really strong. So, yeah. This, a kind of point and a question really do you agree or um where would you go with that that's the that's all the questions ben thank you um yeah so so um uh joe wasn't it um i mean the the boundary changes um, are yes not likely to be good for us although the Tories have given up um, or appear to have given up the idea of reducing uh, the number of seats uh, not surprisingly uh, following last December's election because um, they did so well uh, and um, they probably wouldn't get, get their MPs to um, vote to abolish their seats uh, but also because, as I was saying earlier, the current the current system now now favours them uh, and advantages them. Uh, but the boundary review process has always gone on and will go on. And it's um, I don't need to tell you any, you you, got, you guys on here that it, it's about trying to equalise the 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 size of seats. Um, I think there are other issues around um, voter registration, around individual registration, around um, ID uh, for voting that are much more worrying for us. It's quite difficult for us to argue against um, updating boundaries because you know there's a, there's basically a democratic argument for for um, um, equalising constituencies and because of demographic change in our region, 
when there have been boundary changes recently. In our region, it hasn't made a huge amount of difference and we've tended to gain an extra seat or, or, or two as a whole across the region, not necessarily for Labour, but obviously we need to keep an eye on that, but it is potentially very damaging in those parts of the country in the traditional industri traditional industrial, heart industrial heartlands where the constituency sizes are, are quite small and, and the population is not growing as fast. Um, uh, but, you know, I think we would face that challenge, whatever, and it just adds to the, the size of the mountain that we're going to have to climb to win the next election. I mean, it's bigger than the mountain we had to climb in 1997. It's, um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it can be done. And I, I think particularly, you know, the, 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 the legacy that's going to be COVID and, and, and a hard Brexit or a no deal Brexit um, can only help us. But we've still got a lot, still got a lot of work to do. I mean, any of you who who were out on the doorstep in the last election or um, uh, have done any dialogue canvassing more recently, it's it's getting better. But we've still got a lot of work to do. Um, and uh, I'm confident, I'm confident that we can do it. And I think you know the party is in good hands. And but we've we've got a lot of internal and, and external work to do before we can before we can do that. Um, I think you know the boundary changes. A part of that, but they're not going to be the the the, 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 the there's not they're not going to be the straw that broke broke the camel's back. Um, uh, John, um, uh, a constitutional convention. Uh, yeah, I mean, don't forget one of the reasons that I mean, in my view, one of the reasons that we didn't fully deliver uh, in two thousand and one was because we got another whacking majority and. And paradoxically, the size of the Labour majority made making this change more difficult and winning the argument internally more difficult, uh, particularly against diehard opponents like John Prescott and Jack Straw. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and it's one of those things that I wish Tony had followed through on and didn't. But you can understand at the time, you know, where we were, we had so many other things to clear up after the 18 years of Tory rule that, that the focus of the government was on the NHS and poverty and all the rest of the stuff that, that we did in government. Um, and I, but I think, I hope that people who remember those times, and I will certainly remind them of them, um, will, will be cognizant of the fact that I think it was one of the real mistakes that we didn't follow through on, on constitutional reform, because that would have been a lasting um, progressive radical settlement that would have lasted the history of time. You know, a lot of the great economic and social uh, reforms and improvements we made um, have been undone uh, by uh, the coalition and then the Tory government since, uh, whereas it would have been very difficult, I think, for them to have rolled back, uh, well, they haven't rolled back, um, the constitutional uh, reforms. Um, so yeah, let's make sure we do it uh, next time. And there was a second part to your uh, to your question, which um, I can't I can't read my writing back. Oh, whether it should be a an explicit manifesto promise for electoral reform or a constitutional convention. I think that depends on how convincingly we've won the argument in the party at the time. I think we only have to push. Uh, there's only at any point pushing for what we can get. Uh, if we can get a, an explicit commitment to electoral reform in the manifesto, great. Um, but it may be, uh, you know, uh, to get the votes over the line in the, uh, um, in the conference and in the NEC and in the manifesto drafting committee or whatever they're going to they're they're call themselves, that has to be couched in, in, um, in, uh, not so ambitious language. Uh, in the end, um, uh, I'm, I don't think it. I think what will matter much more is 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 where the party is, and also, of course, the size of our majority. Par paradoxically, ninety seven and two thousand and one made it more difficult to deliver on this promise. Whereas I think I think you know, even the greatest optimist um, probably doesn't expect us to get a majority. At the next election of the size that we had in 1997 and paradoxically that could make it easier to deliver on this um, and even easier of course if we rely on uh, minority party votes 
uh, uh, for e even if you have a small majority, uh, you can imagine that um, uh, uh, offering this to minority parties could be a way of, of tying them in and binding them in um, on difficult votes and difficult on and difficult policies. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, I don't think we should die in the ditch over what's in the manifesto. Let's push 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 for something something maximalist. But if we don't get it, let's not assume that that means it's not going to happen. Um, because uh, you know, I want the next Labour government to under promise and over deliver a bit like. The 97 one did in my view uh, where we, <laughs> we promised very little if you remember it was that pathetic little pledge card with five very modest pledges on it we did a hell of a lot more than that and I hope that's what the next next Labour government does as well. Thank you uh, so much Ben um, I'm going to quote Mary and what she's written in the chat um, as, a, as a sort of closing point which follows quite nicely from what you've been saying is the role of government is to prepare for opposition as Robin Cook used to say and perhaps maybe that's what should have happened after the last Labour government. Um, I'm going to apologise to Ross that we're not going to have time for your question about whether um, uh, um, constitutional reform would help us with the unionist, unionist uh, sorry the unionist do you mean the um, the the um, nationalist problem in Scotland. We might leave that for another day, but I think Scotland is a really, really important point and um, it, it changes the landscape really quite fundamentally for all of us, even those of us in the Southwest. Um, so I'm going to pass back and thank Ben hugely for, for doing this tonight. It's absolutely fantastic. We all do our sort of silent and virtual rounds of applause, which aren't quite the same as a standing ovation, 